Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. On the bench behind me today, I have two AES six-pack audio amplifiers. So that's a total of 12 EL34, or 6CA7, output tubes between the two amplifiers. That's a whole lot of output tubes. So the story on these amplifiers goes like this. A very good friend of mine purchased these some time back. He purchased them used and paid a fair amount of money for them. He didn't hook them up because his sound room wasn't set up at that time. So he finally got his sound room set up, hooks the amplifiers up and says, Paul, these things don't sound quite right. He says one of them has quite an audible hum, and he says maybe you can just go through both of them and make sure they're up to spec. So that's what we're going to do together today. We're going to go through these amplifiers, diagnose them, find the issues, and fix them. Now, there's not a whole lot of information out there about these amplifiers, so we're going to also run some tests on these amplifiers today. We'll take a look at some distortion specs. Then we're going to reverse engineer this amplifier. I'm going to draw up a schematic and we'll check out their design, see how well they did. So let's get started. Here's a look at the front side of these six pack mono block amplifiers. And I do admit they look pretty impressive with all of these output tubes here. Imagine they get pretty hot as well. So these output tubes are EL34s or six CA7s. This tube here is an EL84 vacuum tube. Now, in many other amplifiers, the EL84 is used as an audio output tube itself. What it's doing on this chassis at this point, I cannot tell you because I haven't drawn up a schematic and I haven't reverse engineered these yet. Now, there is some talk online about what this vacuum tube does. I don't want to repeat that without knowing for sure. So we'll talk about the tube functions after I draw up a schematic and reverse engineer these things. This tube here is a 12AX7. There is nothing written on the chassis here because you're supposed to be able to try different tubes in the socket and experiment with the sound. Here's the thing with this particular tube. This tube is most likely going to be the phase inverter. This is a push-pull amplifier and there are two triodes in here. If you're going to be experimenting with this tube, you want to know the state of the tube that you're plugging in here to experiment with. For example, if you're buying a used, say, Mollard Telefunken, or maybe something fancy with a Bugle Boy on the side of it, and you're plugging it into the chassis and experimenting with the sound, unless it's a brand new tube, you don't know whether the two triodes within that vacuum tube are matched. Here's the thing with phase inverter circuits. The phase inverter is the heart of any push-pull amplifier, and any mismatch in these two triodes within this vacuum tube is going to introduce distortion. Here's the thing with an amplifier like this. You have switchable feedback here, so you can turn the feedback right off or you can turn it to negative 10 dB. With the feedback off, there is no feedback in here to reduce distortion and to you know, basically widen out the response. So you want to start off with the lowest distortion that you can get. So you want to have a matched tube in the phase inverter socket. If you don't have a way to match or find out what the triodes are doing inside your used vacuum tubes, your best bet is to plug in a brand new tube. Now, I'm going to uh, let you in a little secret here if you don't know this already. A lot of these fancy tubes like the Mullard and Telefunkins and, and uh, the Bugle Boys, all those kinds of vacuum tubes come out a, a lot of, well, we would say expensive test gear way back in the day. Now, here's the thing with those used vacuum tubes. This tube here, 12AX7, say you're replacing this with a used 12AX7, all right? The 12AX7 has two triodes inside it. Now, if you're going to be putting a used tube in here, and say it came out of a, an old oscilloscope or signal generator or something like that, a lot of the time, each triode within that vacuum tube does a different service. So one triode will be worked harder throughout its service life than the other triode meaning that one triode will probably be a little bit more tired than the other one. That creates a big imbalance. Imbalance introduces distortion. And this is very, very common in test gear. A lot of the times the triodes in the vacuum tube are used for very different functions. So keep that in mind. Using used vacuum tubes anywhere else in the amplification chain is absolutely fine. 
For the phase inverter, again, it's the heart of a push-pull vacuum tube amplifier. You either want to use a brand new tube or you're going to want to know the state of the triodes in your used vacuum tube. Basically, you want a very thorough test on that vacuum tube. Now down the road, together we're going to design a vacuum tube matching device, a very simple device. It'll probably just use a bunch of LEDs and things like that to indicate how close each triode is to each other. And we'll get into that down the road. That greatly ex exceeds the scope of this video here. So we'll design something like that down the road. So what else can I tell you about this amp here? Let's go back to the feedback here. So the feedback is really a personal thing. When you switch the feedback off, you're going to have a peak in the response pattern. So, for example, say the, the peak is around uh, a female vocalist's voice, all right? So say the peak in the response pattern is right around her voice. What it's going to do is it's going to make that female vocalist sound like she's standing out from the rest of the instruments in the band. When you click the feedback on, it flattens the response pattern or makes it more flat. Let's talk about, or we'll, we'll explain it like that. Makes it more flat. So it gets rid of that peak. Maybe now it's just a little bit of a bump where, you know, her voice is. All right. What it's going to do is settle her off and push her back into the rest of the band. That's because it's flattening out the response pattern. So many people like no feedback. And that's really the effect of putting feedback on and off. And of course, adding feedback lowers the distortion within the amplifier. And we'll take a look at this amplifier's distortion here in a little bit. We'll run some really extensive tests on one of these amplifiers here and uh, take a look at what they can do. We'll uh, run it through its, uh, its paces there. So. so let's see what else can I tell you. On off switch here, light uh, filter capacitors in the back here. Can I see those on camera? I can see those on camera. So these are the filter caps right here. They're placing them far away from the vacuum tubes here because the tubes get hot and these these uh, filter caps have got a, a plastic coating on them that'll shrink if they get too hot. So they're placed away from the EL34s. And again, I imagine that these things would heat a small room quite nicely when they're just sitting and idling. Power transformer in the back. So this is creating the B plus for all of the tubes here. So there's going to be quite a bit of high voltage under this chassis. If you're unfamiliar with vacuum tube amplifiers, I strongly suggest you read up on them and learn about high voltage. What this big transformer here does is it takes what comes from the wall and steps it up to about 400 plus volts. So it makes what comes out of the wall much more deadlier than it started out to be. So there's some pretty deadly voltages under the chassis of vacuum tube amplifiers. So if you're experimenting with any type of a vacuum tube amplifier, know that and be very, very careful. And if you're following along, you're doing so at your own risk. Be careful. This here is going to be the audio output transformer and chances are this is going to be placed on a 90 so that these two transformers do not couple with each other. So the audio output transformer will listen to the power transformer and you know there'll be induced hum in the, uh, in the speaker lines. So what they do is they take the transformers and place them 90 so that they don't couple so well. Nice thing about this amplifier is it's probably placed on a 90. I'm imagining it is. And they have a shield on this transformer as well. So the shield, again, is separating the transformers. You can see on this chassis, they're extremely close together. So whenever you're designing any amplifier, you really want the audio output transformer to be as far as possible from the power transformer. And you want the audio amplification chain, the vacuum tubes, to be as far away from the power transformer as well. So the further you can get these things from the power supply, the better. So the audio output tubes, not so incredibly particular about that. Of course, you don't want them to be too incredibly close, but when you're dealing with you know, high gain stages in the front end of the amplifier, they need to be away from this big fella right here. Let's see, what else can I tell you about this here? I think that pretty much covers this. So what I'm going to do now is get rid of one of these things off the bench here and we'll take a look at the backside and I'll explain what it does. Now, I don't know which of these amplifiers is humming and uh, you know which one isn't sounding quite right. So what we'll do is we'll do some experimentation and find out which one is making the noise without taking any covers off. So I'll show you guys how to determine whether the hum coming from an amplifier is from a vacuum tube or from a power supply. So that's coming up here quite shortly. This is the backside to one of these six pack monoblock amplifiers. 
This is the audio input jack here, so a standard RCA type jack. This is a quarter inch jack here. This is used in conjunction with this control here to set the cathode current to all of the EL34 tubes here. Again, EL34, 6CA7, whatever you prefer. In order to set the bias on one of these amplifiers, you do need some form of an external current meter. That external current meter would get plugged into this jack here. And what happens is there's a switch inside this jack. That switch gets opened and what it does is it disconnects the cathodes of all of these EL34s from the chassis and routes the cathodes through your current meter and back to the chassis again. So that allows you to read the cathode current of all of these EL34s. In order to adjust the bias, you slowly advance this control to the desired cathode current. And for this amplifier, they specify 220 to 230 milliamps. And I'll go over how to set this here in just a little bit. One thing that's of paramount importance when you receive one of these amplifiers, if it's been used or, you know, it's not brand new out of the box, they say that the bias is factory preset. I would even, you know, be worried about that. What you should do before you even plug anything into this amplifier, so no AC is applied to this, take this control and put it to its extreme counterclockwise position. What that does is that puts the most negative voltage on the control grids of these vacuum tubes. So basically you're turning these vacuum tubes off when you have this at its extreme counterclockwise position. Once the amplifier has been warmed up for a set period of time, for argument's sake, we'll say 10 minutes is a nice comfortable time to let everything stabilize. What you're going to do with your current meter in line and plugged into this jack is advance this control until you reach your desired cathode current. At that point, what you do is basically you, you can shut the amplifier off, remove your jack, and then the bias is set at that point. And then every time you turn your amplifier on, it should be correct. If you ever change any vacuum tubes and after the amplifier has been running for a while, it's always a good idea to every now and then just check to make sure that the bias is okay. Now, the reason that this is so incredibly important is just say this is up here like this and you turn the amplifier on. What happens is, is the cathode current to these vacuum tubes is going to be extremely high. There's a chance it's going to blow the fuse that's hiding down in here. And if it sets at a really high current for an extremely long time, that is hard on the power transformer. Now, you, there is no way to set the bias control on an amplifier like this by ear or anything like that. You know, you can't say that, oh, it sounds better up here and then it sounds here. This has to be set with a meter. This is very, very important because you can damage the tubes and you can also damage the transformer and take the fuse out if for some reason the, the current on these tubes, the cathode current, is too high. So always keep that in mind. This is a very, very important control. Now somebody on this amplifier has put a knob on this. You can see that there's a knob on here. I believe from the factory there's just a shaft protruding from the back of the chassis. Even that, I'm not really comfortable with. Whenever I've designed an amplifier like this, any kind of a mono block or any other type of amplifier, the control is always countersunk in the chassis, or there is some form of a retainer nut on the actual shaft so that you can't move that shaft inadvertently. Now, I don't know why they have the shaft protruding from the back and they didn't use a countersunk you know, control in here. Basically, if the control is countersunk, you stick a screwdriver in, advance it, and it's safe. You know, if you're touching the amplifier or anything like that, you can't bump the control, you know, and, you know, basically take the thing out of adjustment. And the bias control on these amplifiers is, you know, it's a, it's a real crucial thing. And I'll show you what I mean here when I'm setting the bias up. I'll show you exactly how to set the bias up here in a little bit. So this control is very important to have sitting in the right position. And again, if you change any vacuum tubes on here or even move one around, anything like that, you know, if you're handling them, taking them out of the chassis, it's always a good idea just to check the bias again, make sure everything is okay. Over here we have the output jack, so this just runs to the speaker. We have a switch on the bottom which selects the impedance. We have a fuse over here. Now it says tube fuse. 
what this exactly does inside here at this point, again, I haven't drawn the schematic, so I'll determine this in a little bit. I have an idea of what it does, but again, I don't want to say anything until you know, I've determined its, its function. So we have a fuse here, and there's also a fuse hiding in the bottom down here, so don't forget about this one right here. If for some reason you turn the switch on and this fuse looks okay, the fuse in here could be shot. So what I'm going to do is turn that to its extreme counterclockwise position. I'm going to apply power to this amplifier and I will show you how to set the bias next. This is how you set the bias on a six pack mono block amplifier. I have my current meter attached to the bias jack here. Now this is an older panel meter and it works well with the camera. You don't need to use an old meter like this. If you have a modern digital multimeter that has the ability to read current, you can use that as well. So the first thing you want to do is make sure the bias adjustment is completely counterclockwise. So it's at its stop. At that point, turn the filaments on. Let the vacuum tubes warm up for a set period of time. Again, 10 minutes would be fine. Let everything stabilize. I'm not going to wait that long for the adjustment here. I'm just going to give you the idea of how this works. And then we'll move on from there. Now you'll notice that the vacuum tubes will draw just a little bit of current, even with this completely counterclockwise, that's absolutely fine. If you were to turn this on and it went up to 250 milliamps with this completely counterclockwise, you would definitely have some form of a problem, either with a vacuum tube or the bias circuit itself. So this is gonna settle off here in just a moment. All the cathodes in these EL34s are glowing nice and orange. They sure do have a lot of cathode area. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is advance this until this reads 220 milliamps. Let's roll this up. I'll get it close. That looks to be close to 220. Now it can be 220 to 230 is absolutely fine. At this point, after that 10 minute warm up period, you would shut the amplifier off, remove this jack and the bias is set. Just make sure that you do not bump that control in any way, shape or form. And that's just how easy it is to set the bias. Now, to give you an idea of how sensitive this control is, if I move this just a little bit more over, watch what happens to the current here. So this is at about, well, just a little bit past 12 o'clock. If I move that towards one o'clock, I can bring this right to 300 mils, no problems, right? Very quickly. Now, brief excursions like that isn't gonna hurt anything, but that was only one o'clock. This control can go all the way down to five o'clock. So you can imagine, let's just turn that back down to 220 or thereabouts, it's close enough. So you can imagine what would happen if this was completely clockwise and you flip the switch once the filaments came on, the thing would draw heavy current, the fuse would go away and the amplifier would go dark. So a lot of bias adjustments on guitar amplifiers and things like that only have a limited range so that the owner really can't cause too much damage if the bias adjustment is way off. There is no limited range with this bias adjustment, so you can basically turn these tubes right on. So not only is that hard on the power transformer and everything else, it's also hard on the windings in the audio output transformer as well. So you can see how very important it is to have that bias adjustment in the right area. So what I'm gonna do now is shut this off, adjust the bias in the other amplifier and get this ready to test so we can find out which amplifier is humming. Both amplifiers are attached to the oscilloscope. This amplifier here is the upper channel. This amplifier here is the lower channel. So what I'm seeing on the oscilloscope right now is indicating a bunch of different issues. I'll just zoom on into the oscilloscope and explain what I see. So we can clearly see on the upper channel here that there's quite a bit of noise on that 120 cycle ripple. On the bottom channel, you can see that there is a 120 cycle ripple, but it is quite a bit quieter. So this amplifier here, just zoom back out. So this amplifier here has got some noise happening as well as ripple, but they both have ripple. Now we can see that the lower channel, if we take a look at the level of the ripple, now there are no loads attached to these amplifiers. 
So this is just the scope probes attached to the audio amplifier outputs. You see on the lower channel we have between say 7 and 9 millivolts of ripple. The upper channel, the amplitude is a little bit higher and it is quite unstable because of all the noise on the signal. So we're probably dealing with between you know, 10 and 12 millivolts of ripple, something like that on the upper channel. Now since we see on the bottom channel, we have a relatively stable readout for frequency. It says 120 hertz. What does that tell us? Well, that tells us that this is power supply hum in both of these amplifiers. In an amplifier of this size, they would not have half wave rectification. They have full wave rectification in both of these amplifiers. And in any large amplifier, they're going to have full wave rectification. Whenever you have full wave rectification and you see 120 cycle hum, that means that you have a power supply issue. So if there was 60 cycle hum present, say it was a 60 cycle signal on the oscilloscope there, and it said 60 cycles instead of 120, we would know that that hum is most likely coming from a heater to cathode leak or something like that in a preamplifier tube, or there's something wrong in an amplification stage. When you see 120 cycle hum, it's almost hands down, there's a power supply issue. So we know that both channels have power supply issues. There's 120 cycle hum in both of these channels here. Now, I'm not sure of the actual level of 120 cycle hum that these amplifiers have just from the factory. Uh, from what I can see, you know, seven millivolts, eight millivolts on one channel here is a fair amount of hum. Even with no load hooked up, if I was to hook a, a speaker up to that, it would be quite audible in the speaker. So just say I had three millivolts of hum, that's getting down there, but it is still quite audible in a speaker. And if you have very efficient speakers, that could be quite nauseating. So there are some issues in both of these amplifiers here. So what we're going to do is address the noisier one first. We'll take a look at this amplifier here, turn it upside down and check around inside. So since I'm seeing 120 cycle hum and I'm seeing noise, these two guys here are a suspect. So we'll check out the capacitors. I've removed all the screws on the bottom side here. That's all it really takes to get in here. As we can see, there's some sort of a fluid leakage here. So if we look on the other side, we can see that there's quite a bit of fluid leakage there. So that's on this side. And as you can see on that capacitor down there, it looks like it's been physically leaking. Let's put this bottom half over there. So there's quite a bit of discoloration on those pins there. So what we want to do is test that cap. So what I'll do is I'll grab a voltmeter over here. So the first thing I want to do is make sure it's discharged. Now this has been off for quite a while at this point, but you can never be too safe. Always make sure that it's discharged first. And there's about half a volt on it. No problems there. There's another large can on this side here that I'm going to have to check. So this out of the way here. I don't know their configuration. So if that one's charged and this one isn't, there could still be some pretty big issues. So I'll just move this over here. You're not going to be able to see that because it looks like it's underneath an inductor here of some form. So what I'll do is put this back over here again. Keep the light off that. And I think I can get this way under there. It's a nice thing about these little probes here is you can get them way under there. And no problems, 0 0.03 of a volt. So that's completely discharged. Now there are quite a few other caps in here as well. I'm pretty sure that they're all discharged at this point. It's got a little bit of a sleeve on it. Oh yeah, no problems. Everything is discharged. 2200 at 25 volts there. It'll be absolutely fine. All right, so I know the caps are discharged. So what I'll do, I'll just center this up. Shot again. See, look at that. That's looking pretty ugly. 
So let's measure this capacitor here. Let's see if we can just measure it in circuit for a quick test. Get an idea. All right. Seventy six microfarad. Okay. Let's take a look at this one on this side here. Five hundred and eighteen microfarad around that. So if this down here if I follow this line here goes over to this cap and this one here runs out this one yeah so this is telling me and this one here is actually running off to ground so that's running off to this ground they have a star type ground system down here you see that little star down there they're doing that to try and reduce hum so this is the negative side. This runs off to the star type ground. This runs over to this side here. So as you can see, this side's negative will run over to this side's positive and the negative of this capacitor would go here, meaning that both of these capacitors here are in series, not parallel. So if these two capacitors are in series, they're gonna to have to be the same value and it's not gonna be 70 some odd microfarad. It's most likely going to be close to that 500 microfarad that we see here. So chances are, what's happened is this capacitor has failed. Now, the reason that that capacitor has failed could be a number of reasons. Since they're in series, they've got a bleeder on them, and sometimes they use this to try and equalize a small amount of the current as well. So this looks like 100k ohms across this capacitor here, and there's another one over here. Chances are, since these capacitors are in series, when you first turn the amplifier on and all of the vacuum tubes in this amplifier are not warmed up, chances are the B plus goes way, 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 way up. So most capacitors this size here top out around 450 volts. So I'm imagining that they have two capacitors here in series in order to get that voltage up. So whenever you put capacitors in series, you get double the voltage at half the capacitance. So just say that this was 500 microfarad, for argument's sake. 500 and 500 would make 250 microfarad if they're in series. If each cap was rated at 400 volts, we would have 800 volts total. So 800 volts at 250 microfarad. So both of the caps have to be the same. Now, usually what causes the cap to fail, all right, so this cap here has failed, is chances are this capacitor here may be very leaky or it's pulling excessive current. So when you first turn the amplifier on, if this capacitor here pulls excessive current, this one here might go over its rated voltage. If this capacitor goes over its rated voltage, it's going to let out the goop. So, and that's probably what's happened here. Usually these capacitors are very good. You can see that it hasn't leaked out of the vent at all, but it looks like it's actually coming down the legs. So, you know, it could be a number of reasons why this capacitor failed. Maybe even somebody over tightened these and broke the seal in the base. Really hard to say at this point. But I can tell you when two capacitors are in series like this, they are going to be the same value. And if at the factory they did spend any time with their capacitors, they're going to probably spend some time matching the leakage current, in both of these capacitors to make sure that they charge equally. And then of course, these resistors help out with that and they also act as a bleeder. So somewhat of a voltage divider across these capacitors. So this capacitor is very bad. So that's probably part of the reason why this is humming. Now in the other amplifier, I'm not really too sure if that's gonna be an issue in that amp as well. I'll have to look at that in a little bit. So we'll just focus on this one for now. So what I'm going to do is replace these two capacitors here. Now, I haven't drawn up the schematic for this amplifier yet, and I plan on doing that very quickly here. So in fact, I might just do that before the next shot. So what I'll do is I'll take this over to another bench, spend some time with some paper and a pencil and draw this up. And uh, when I have this thing drawn up, I'll come back and we'll take a look at its design as well after I've changed these capacitors. 
I've now replaced both of the capacitors in the power supply section of this amplifier. You'll see that I'm using a more modern snap-in style capacitor on each side. The reason I prefer using this style of capacitor is because I can solder the connections directly to the bottom of the capacitor. I much prefer a solder connection over a screw type connection. You'll also notice that I've increased the wire size running to the capacitors. In this circuit here, all the orange wiring that you see here has been replaced. That wiring is much larger than the original sized wiring here. This wiring is also a high temperature wiring as well. So now that both capacitors have been replaced, the unit has been on for a while and it's biased, let's take a look at the result on the oscilloscope screen. Now that's dropped the ripple down quite substantially. It's even lower than the other amplifier, but there is still quite a bit of ripple there. So about 4.8, 4.9 millivolts. And again, that's with no load across the speaker terminals. Now, if you have inefficient speakers, that is not gonna be all that audible. You gotta remember when you hook the speakers up to it, you know, it's this, what you're seeing here, again, is just, you know, wide open speaker terminals. So inefficient speakers, yeah, it's gonna be pretty quiet. Yet, if you're in a very quiet room, you're still gonna hear that. Now, this cannot be left in this amplifier like this at all because these amplifiers are powering up some Klipsch corner horns. And for those of you that are familiar with those speakers, any kind of noise is gonna show up on that, especially when you have a, a monster-sized horn, you know, sitting directly at your head level when you're sitting in the audio room, so it's definitely going to be, you know, it's going to be presenting this, let's put it that way. So what we need to do is get rid of this, this hum and a little bit of noise there, very little noise. It also cleaned up the noise quite a bit. So we need to make this as low as possible. Now, I'm not sure if this particular level is standard for this amplifier. I know that if I plug the other amplifier in with good capacitors, it's right around this. So this is uh, kind of interesting. What we need to do is get rid of this and find out why this is there. What you want to do is pretty much bring this to the absolute least amount of this that you can see on the screen. You want to get that as close to a straight line as possible. So that's what we're going to work on next here. What we're going to do is take a look at the schematic as well. I finished drawing up that schematic. That was pretty time consuming. So I drew that up and marked down all the voltages and took some measurements inside here so we can get a good idea of what the engineers were thinking of when they put this together. So we'll take a look at that schematic next, go over that, compare that to this amplifier, and then we'll work on getting rid of this hum or reducing it. And by doing that, it should give you some good ideas if you're designing amplifiers on your own or if you encounter this problem in another amplifier where you can look to try and solve these issues. All right, let's check out this amplifier's design. So first of all, the schematic diagram that you see here is a direct result of what I found within this amplifier's chassis. By no means is this a brand new amplifier. This amplifier has been around for a while and it was purchased used by its owner, which means that it may have had multiple owners in the past. If any of those multiple owners in the past has modified this amplifier in any way, shape or form, since this is the amplifier that I reverse engineered to get the schematic, any of those modifications are going to appear on this schematic. So take what you see here with a grain of salt. Now I can tell you this, if there has been any modifications done to this amplifier, they were done very well. So it's really nice and clean inside. So let's start with the output section here first. We have six EL34s on this chassis, which makes this thing a wonderful room heater. You'll notice that all the plate lines are tied together. So the plates are the upside down T symbols in the vacuum tube symbol here, or anode if you like. They're all tied together and they go to one end of the audio transformers winding. Likewise on this side. All the plates are tied together and they go to this end of the winding. This is known as a push-pull configuration. You'll notice on the audio transformer itself, there's a bunch of leads that go nowhere. It just says NC and NC. In the chassis here itself, there are a bunch of leads coming out of the existing audio transformer that are just capped off. So they're folded over and basically heat shrunk. 
That tells me that this audio transformer was most likely intended for ultralinear operation. Now, that doesn't mean you need to use it for ultralinear operation, it just gives you that option. So normally, if you were to have this in an ultralinear configuration, these would be attached to the screen grids of the tubes here. So the screen grid is the centermost dots in these vacuum tubes here. So they're not doing that because the screen grids are tied to the plate through 100 ohm resistors, and that's known as triode connecting these pentodes. So the reason that they have 100 ohm resistors in line with the screen grid to the plate is to stop the amplifier from randomly breaking into oscillation. After all, you did purchase an amplifier, not a signal generator. If for any reason this amplifier did break into oscillation on its own, there's enough tubes and iron on this chassis to severely damage your speaker and your hearing as well. So that needs to be taken care of. You need to sweep the, the entire amplifier with a range of frequencies and make sure that you can't even kick the thing into oscillation. That's another reason that there are 1K resistors on the control grids as well, again, to stop these oscillations. A lot of the times when oscillations happen in an amplifier like this, they're above our hearing range. So what they do is they attack the tweeters and the speakers and they'll pop the speakers. So what happens is when the amplifier oscillates at a very high frequency above our hearing range, the capacitor in the crossover inside your speaker that's in line with the tweeter looks like a short circuit at that frequency. And what it does is it fries the tweeters. And of course, it's also making your neighbor's cats probably run for the hills as well. So one thing to keep in mind, if you're ever designing an audio amplifier, you always want to sweep it and make sure that there is no high frequency oscillations, at least above our hearing range happening, because it is quite common in this particular type of amplifier design. Now, some tubes get excited a little bit easier than others. You'll notice that all the plates on these vacuum tubes are just tied together. On some tubes, you can't do that. You need a resistor in there as well. For example, a tube that gets excited rather easily are the old 6L6Gs. Not the GC version, but the Gs. The Gs look like uh, an 807 with a, without the cap on the top. That's the old 6L6 design. Those vacuum tubes very easily oscillate up to 30 megahertz with basically no issues. So becoming an oscillator in the audible range is basically, you know, a cakewalk for those vacuum tubes. So something to keep in mind if you're ever designing an amplifier with multiple 6L6Gs in it. So they've obviously found that this won't break into oscillation, so they've stopped this, you know, putting resistors in at that point there. You'll notice that the suppressor grid, the suppressor grid is the grid that's closest to the plate or the anode. They're all tied together. They actually tie at each tube to the cathode. I've drawn them connected together and just tied to the cathode line for ease of drawing here. That's pretty standard. The suppressor grid is inside the vacuum tube to suppress secondary emission. So basically electron spray from coming back off the plates and back in the tube again and creating noise. So that's why they're there. So kind of a nice design that the fact that they can actually have that in the vacuum tube triode connecting EL34s is is actually kind of a bonus because if you just have triodes you know you can still get that effect happening whereas this you get that added effect of getting rid of that secondary emission so one bonus of running pentodes triode connected you'll notice that all the cathodes are tied together the cathodes are tied together and they run here to this 500 milliamp fuse, which is this fuse on the back of the unit here, and then through a 10 ohm resistor to the bias jack. When you stick that jack in there that runs to your external current meter, it breaks this connection and places the current meter in line with the cathodes to the chassis so you can effectively set the bias. Now, one of the things that I do find odd about this design is this bias is basically from zero to full throttle. A lot of uh, vacuum tube audio manufacturers will not let that happen. They'll only give you a certain range to bias your amplifier up in. So basically, if you turn the tubes on a little bit too hard, you know, it's not going to really damage too much because it's only a limited range. This thing here, you, know, you can bring it from, you know, basically zero to full throttle and it'll actually take a fuse out and possibly pop the line fuse which makes me wonder if that has been modified within this amplifier. I noticed that this 27K ohm resistor here looks a little bit different than all the rest of the resistors. And there's also a resistor on the bias pot that's just basically 
bridged out a circuit. It's not really doing anything. So it may have been modified. There may be an actual limited range that these things came with and somebody took that limit off there. So basically took the governor off the amplifier and allows you to move the bias anywhere you want. Now, for my own reasons, I purpose, uh, I really like that. That, that I, I honestly, I, I don't want any limitation. You know, that's, that's, um, I would purposely set my own amplifier up that way, put it that way. Now, I don't like this bias control at all. And even with this black knob off here, I don't like the shaft sticking out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace those with some very high quality Allen Bradley controls. As you can see, this is countersunk. So this here, you just unthread and then you put this on the inside and put this through the chassis. And this can be tightened up with a rather large Allen wrench. And then the control is countersunk. So once it's set, you can't bump it or move it and everything remains the same for a long period of time. This is really handy because if you're going to be, you know, playing with speaker cables or anything around the backside and, you know, even a speaker cable, if it rubs up against this, it's going to adjust the bias. And if you don't have a current meter on here, you don't know, right? So it might be running way over current and you know, bad things will happen. So you really don't want to have too much current there because, you know, you're, you're putting a lot of DC current across the winding of this audio transformer and across the choke and you're pulling excessive current from that power transformer in the back. So, you know, you, you kind of just want to run it where it's supposed to be run. Another reason why a lot of audio manufacturers will limit the range of the bias is because a lot of people think that they can just set the bias to where it sounds good. Well, let me tell you this, a lot of these amplifiers sound really good when they're drawing way too much current. That's very hard on parts. So it definitely has to be set with an external meter. So all the grid lines are tied together. This is the control grid here. The control grid is the first set of dots right above the cathode here, and that's what controls the tube. That's where the signal goes. So you can see that they're all tied together and they're isolated by these 1K resistors, and that runs over to one triode in the phase inverter circuit here. This is the, the entire phase inverter circuit right here, and I'll start talking about this here in just a little bit. Same on this side, runs over to this side and runs over to this triode in this 12AX7. Now you can plug a bunch of different tubes in the phase inverter here and you know just experiment with tubes. Again, for just demonstration purposes, we'll call this a 12AX7 in this circuit. So let's see, let's make sure I'm not uh, forgetting anything about the uh, audio output section here. So, okay, so for the bias line here, we'll just talk about this quickly first. The bias line, which basically is what allows you to change the negative voltage on the control grids of all of these EL34s, runs down here to this bias set control, and that's that control on the back. And then, of course, we have a, a, a resistor, which is, again, going to limit its range by changing this resistor. You can, you know, add or take away from its range. So this bias control, this 25K potentiometer on the back side here is basically split off to both sides. So there's a 68K ohm resistor and a 0.1 microfarad on this side, and there's a 68K ohm resistor and a 0.1 microfarad capacitor on this side. And we'll take a look at those here in just a little bit. I'll do the schematic first here because if I move the schematic, it completely changes the exposure level of the camera. And I gotta change this all over here again. So we'll come back to that in just a little bit. Looking a little closer at the phase inverter circuit here, so we have our 12AX7 or whatever tube you want to plug in that socket here. And they have a tube down here which they call a current source. I would prefer to call that a current sink. So this EL84 here is in the cathode line here as a, a constant current sink on the bottom portion of the tube. Now on the top side of this phase inverter circuit here, you'll notice that we have a regulated high voltage supply. So the B plus comes out of here and it just attaches to this point here. We have an NPN transistor up here with two Zener diodes acting as a reference on the base here. And we have that 100K ohm resistor running over to the base to turn the whole system on, keep everything running properly. Now, these are five watt Zener diodes and they're just kind of floating in midair. And yeah, they're gonna get probably a little bit warm. Now, with temperature, these things move around so it's always a good idea to put a little clip around them and strap them to the chassis with some heat sink compound and that stabilizes things. They haven't done that in here. It's just, they're kind of floating in midair. That's not so much of a big deal. It'll probably move from say 318 to 325 volts while it's warming up. 
And that's just because, you know, everything is moving around here. So, you know, heat-wise at any rate. So in the amplifiers that I've designed where I've used, you know, uh, a linear regulator, that's what this is. This is a linear regulator, and this is acting as basically a pass element, the most quietest type of regulator, put it like that. So whenever I've designed these circuits, I've always had a little, it's aluminum clip, and I put it around the body of the diode and tighten it to the chassis, and that works very well to stabilize these up. And when we get into some amplifier design here in the future, I'll start talking about this and I'll show you some of those design tricks that stabilize these things. Little teeny things that you can do that really mean a lot for performance. Anyways, back to this here. So these circuits are relatively quiet as it is, but in order to make sure that it stays quiet, they've put a one microfarad capacitor here to ground. Now the two resistors on the plates of the phase inverter circuit here are very closely matched. In fact, they're so closely matched, they're 27.4, that's getting pretty accurate, 27.4K, 1%, 50 parts per million resistors. So basically what the designers of this circuit are doing is they're, they're putting this together, and what this tells me is they're saying, okay, this circuit is only going to be as good as the vacuum tubes that you put in it. And that's basically what they're saying. The circuit is very, very accurate. It's got a regulated supply, you know, very accurate resistors. The next step is to get the best matched triodes inside of a 12AX7 that you can get. And there's a, a way of actually doing that. You could run jacks onto the sides and do that, and I might discuss that here in a little bit. Again, down the road, I'm going to design a, a triode matcher, so basically you can check out all of your tubes and see how closely matched they are. And if you go to a tube supply place that's nice enough, they might even let you plug them in and try them out and choose your best tubes. At any rate, so we have our phase inverter circuit here, and then down here we have a current sink. Now, this thing here looks like a very high impedance at AC, but yet passes DC current, and it's great for this circuit to keep everything in balance. And that's the reason that they're putting this thing here, and they're using an EL84 to do this. Now, the thing I don't understand is they put a regulated supply on the B+, but on the negative supply, there's no regulation. The negative supply can still move around. Maybe they found that it doesn't move around enough. Maybe they're expecting you to have stable line voltage or something like that. I don't know. If I was to design this, this would definitely have a regulated negative supply. So that would be another step in making this thing even better. So something to think about if you want to improve your amplifier. any rate, we have our feedback tied to this grid here. It goes through 22K ohm resistor. The feedback switch is... This one here runs over here to the speaker jack in the back. And of course we have our switch back here, which is our speaker impedance selection switch. Let's see, what else can I talk about here? We have the, um, the audio jack in the back is actually lifted a little bit. We have a 100 ohm resistor to ground here. So this is not at chassis ground. This is an isolated ground on this RCA jack in the back. You can see it's lifted by 100 ohms. Something to keep in mind. In the power supply here, we have a very large transformer on the back side of the chassis, and it's got two primary windings. So in this configuration for 120 volts, the primary windings are in parallel. If you wanted to use this at 240, you would put those in series, which is kind of nice. It allows you to use this in Europe as well. All you have to do is just change that configuration. On this side here, we have our high voltage winding. This high voltage winding has two 1N5408s in series in this string and another two in series in this string. The reason they're doing this is to raise the PIV. So basically what's going to happen is every now and then when you click the switch on the amplifier, you're going to get a bit of an inductive spike happening. If it ex exceeds the diode's maximum reverse or the PIV, it's going to cause the diode to change its state to a jumper. And that's a bad thing. When diodes turn into jumpers, windings get very hot and fuses start to blow. So by putting these things in, in series like this, you're basically doubling the PIV. So it's just making things a little bit safer. We have a two Henry choke over here, and that's the large choke in the center of the chassis. We'll take a look at that. If you don't have the ability to read, say you don't have an LCR meter, the DC resistance is 30 ohms. And that runs over here to our two large capacitors that are in series at the back here. We have two 100k ohm resistors that are in parallel with each capacitor, basically just acting as bleeders. 
and there will also act to stabilize any kind of leakage across the uh, the uh, capacitors as well so if um, one capacitor has a little bit higher leakage than the other it'll it'll work to stabilize it now that's not a whole lot there but it'll help out a little bit now to give you an idea I have a box full of these filter capacitors the ones that we just looked at I tested about 20 of them in my box and matched two up that have very similar leakage so that they charge evenly. So basically what happens is when all the vacuum tubes are cold on this chassis and you first click that power switch on, there is no load being drawn. So what that means at this point is where it says 400 volts here, this goes up to 600 volts and it sits at 600 volts until all of these large power tubes start to draw current. At that point, it pulls that down to 400 volts. That's the reason they have two capacitors in series like this. If they didn't have that, it would exceed the voltage rating of the capacitors and the capacitors would explode. So it's very important. So this settles off around 400 volts, very close to 400 volts. Now you'll notice that there's no filter capacitor on this side here. If you were to add a small amount of capacitance here, this voltage would go up quite dramatically. So this inductor here is doing a lot of filtering here. So it's trying to get rid of that ripple. We'll notice down here we have a negative uh, supply here for our bias setup. So the diode is in reverse and you'll notice that the capacitors are all in reverse. You'll notice that the positive portion of the capacitor runs to ground. So this choke here is 11 Henry's, or this reactor is 11 Henry's. The DC resistance is 496 ohms. Again, if you don't have an LCR meter. We have an, uh, a two mic filter on this end here. There's a 47 mic at 350 here, and there's another filter over here. That's kind of an odd setup. I don't know if anybody's moved anything around here, but that's the way that this amplifier is set up. It seems to work okay. They're running the filaments of the 12AX7 off DC here, so it's only half wave rectification. You got one diode here, and there's a 2200 microfarad capacitor, 25 volts. And that runs to the filaments over there. Now the filament voltage is a little high. It measures up at 6.9 volts, supposed to be 6.3. In order to get a little bit more filtering, you could actually put a resistor in line between the diode and this capacitor here, and it would smooth things up even more if you wanted to get a bit more filtering. You drop that down to 6.3, you'd be doing very well. So that's there. So we have one winding that runs three EL34s and one EL84. So they'll run all the EL34s and this one EL84. And then this other winding here will go to just the three, L, three EL34s, this one right here. And this is running off of the backside of the diode on this filament winding. So they're using it for AC supply and for a DC supply as well. Let's see, what else can I tell you about this? I think that's pretty much it. So I have to say this design is a really good design. It, there, it just is like, I mean, it's a really nice design. And honestly, the guys that designed this, I give you a thumbs up. You did great. It looks good. Again, the things I would have addressed you know, are the, you know, the Zener drift, you know, and I would have regulated this negative line here a little bit, but everything else seems to be very good. So, there, you know, there's a bunch of things that, uh, you know, might be able to be moved around in the chassis, things that I don't quite agree with at this point. But other than that, the design itself is, is really sound. It looks like a really good design. So all in all, I am pretty impressed with it, and it's bound to sound very nice when it's running. Again, you know, these things triode connected, you know, getting rid of that secondary emission there, you know, by, you know, the bonus of running a pentode in a triode connection. So... Yeah, all in all, it looks very good. So next, what we're going to do is we'll take a look inside the chassis here, and I'll just briefly explain what uh, where all the parts and pieces are. Okay, I'll just show you where some of the parts are on the chassis here, according to the schematic. So anyways, this transistor that you see at the top of the schematic right here is this transistor right down here. The Zener diodes are right down in this little boot down in the bottom. You can see that little kind of a heat shrink boot down there they're sitting down there so those are these two diodes right here let's see what else here this is the filter reactor for the negative line this is the filter reactor for the high voltage so the 400 volts here 
This is the capacitor and resistor combination right here that is on the grid line here. So the 68K and the 0.1 microfarad, that's what that is right there. There's one on each side, so that cap there and this cap here. That's why I marked on the schematic times too. Let's see, what else is down here? This is the, the rectifier diode that changes the, uh, the filament winding to DC for the 12AX7 here, and this is the filter cap for that there. On the side, this diode that you see down here is the, the diode for the negative bias. So that's the negative bias diode right there. And the other diode I just showed you was this one here in the filament. The filament's there. And these are those two very high accuracy resistors here. So this resistor here and this resistor here are these two that are in the plate lines of the uh, 12AX7 there. These are the coupling caps. This coupling cap here and this coupling cap here are the two coupling caps that couple the signal into the, the final section here to the EL34 section. These are all the, the screen grid to plate resistors here. Hence the triode connection. You can see them all here. And let's see, I think that's pretty much it. The capacitors for filtering the, the negative bias right here. And one thing that I didn't draw on the schematic, which is kind of interesting, this resistor here, see this is B plus, this is 400 volts here, right? This is a 470 K ohm resistor and that runs directly to the LED on the face. Kind of an interesting connection. The LED's countersunk, you know, so you really can't be sticking your fingers on it if it popped its head off or something like that, nothing would happen. Common failure point for LEDs is they, you know, they kind of blow apart odd to that they're running that off the high voltage line probably did that to reduce hum maybe if they ran the led off the heater line it induced some hum here or something like that kind of interesting <laughs> running an led through a 470 k ohm resistor off the 400 volt b plus line oh these are the uh, the two windings that are just capped off so those are the the screen windings that would most likely put the audio transformer down on the other side of the chassis uh, allow you to use it for ultra linear operation i should say and I think that is about it. So next what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the specs of this amplifier. Now, we still have ripple in this thing. I haven't addressed that ripple and we need to find out where that is. But I think at this point, the amplifier is pretty much supposed to be like that. You know, I did, both of them are doing it and, you know, it's just, it's, it's kind of bizarre. So I think that small amount of ripple is supposed to be tolerable. So I could be wrong, but you know, it's, um, it's looking pretty much that way. So I don't want to change anything in here. I don't want to modify the design before we check out its frequency range and, uh, look at distortion specs and things like that. Also want to see how much power this thing puts out. So we'll, uh, we'll uh, bring this thing up to full throttle and see what it does here. Let's see how many Watts this amplifier gives us. So any guesses? The test frequency is 400 cycles. The display you see here reads out directly in watts. The amplifier is terminated into an 8 ohm resistive load. The oscilloscope is here to show us when the amplifier starts to clip. We'll back the amplitude down until the clipping goes away and that's the maximum usable output that we can get out of this amplifier. So I'll advance the gain on the signal generator and let's take a look. Here we go. Bump this down once. And as you can see, it's just starting to flat top. So that's the flat topping there. If I advance it a little more, you can really see it gets pronounced. So what I'm going to do is back this down until I have a nice clean sine wave. Right about there is about the limit. So we could probably take it right down to about there. So I'd say 52 watts. So it's working great. They specify the amplifier is supposed to do 50 watts and it's making 52. So it does what it's supposed to do. Here's an example of what crossover distortion looks like in a vacuum tube amplifier. And this is mostly caused by an incorrect bias setting. So basically if the tubes are turned off too much, so the bias voltage is too high on the control grids, 
you get this effect. And it looks like it's splitting the sine wave up. So what I'll do is I'll advance the signal generator and show you what that's about. That's what crossover distortion looks like. You can see it looks like you have a split in the sine wave here. And that is due to an incorrect bias setting. So basically the, the tubes have got way too much negative voltage on the control grids. So what I'm going to do now is advance the bias on the amplifier to get rid of that. I'm going to have to go back and forth between this and the signal generator here. So I'll advance this. You'll see the amplitude rise because we're turning the tubes on more and you'll see that crossover distortion start to disappear. So I'm going to turn the amplitude down. Advance this some more. So it looks like it's almost gone at this point, so I'll advance it just a little bit more. I would say that that is a very nice safe zone, so I'll turn this down. Looks good. So what I'm going to do now is plug in the current meter into the back, into our bias jack. and take a look at the cathode current. That's a whole lot less than 220 milliamps, isn't it? It's 160 milliamps. And we have no crossover distortion at 160. So this goes to show you how useful an oscilloscope can be. You can actually adjust your amplifier using your oscilloscope to get rid of the crossover distortion and determine the right bias level. The reason that they give just a generic bias level, say 220 to 230 milliamps, is because that's pretty much safe in all applications and most people don't have an oscilloscope. By using an oscilloscope to set the bias in this amplifier, in that there is a lot of a safe zone there, I could turn this down even more. I advanced it quite a bit. So by using an oscilloscope to set the bias in the amplifier, not only are you going to make your amplifier run cooler, you're going to make the vacuum tubes last longer. It's just an all-around better situation. A very quick Mr. Carlson's lab modification to this amplifier. Any guesses how many watts it's going to make now? The amplifier is still triode connected the ultra-linear taps have not been hooked up. So here we go. So it starts to flat top at about a hundred... I'd say about 105 watts. So there's a continuous 105 watts output right now. Just turn that down. So any guesses on what I did to make it do that? The modification took, I would say, 15 seconds. Anyways, okay, back to stock. Let's check out this amplifier's frequency response, or useful frequency range. So the machine you're looking at is a Stanford Research Systems model SR780. And this machine is going to draw us a graph and show us how well this amplifier is performing. So how the machine works is it feeds a signal out into the input of the amplifier. So into that RCA jack, the signal goes through the amplifier. And then the machine monitors the output of the amplifier. So there's two leads hooked up to this machine right now. It monitors the output of the amplifier across an eight ohm load. And that is going to, again, show us how well this amplifier performs and shows us its useful frequency range. Now I have this set up so that it's going to go just under its maximum power, about the 49 watt level or something like that, because I don't want to drive the amp into distortion. So we'll see how well it performs right up to its maximum power. 
This is in the zero dB position right now, so there is no feedback in this position. So if you own one of these amplifiers, you might want to get out a piece of paper and take some notes. Here we go. This will take a small amount of time. As I say, it's slowly sweeping a frequency range and then monitoring it and drawing a graph showing us exactly what's going on within this amplifier. And I have it set to 300 points, so it's pretty accurate. The more amount of points I set, the longer it takes to draw the graph, so this is kind of a happy medium. So right now the frequency is slowly climbing from 10 hertz to 100 kilohertz. You may have heard that. I'm not sure if the mic picked that up. That was it sweeping the range there. Okay, so let's take a look at this amplifier's 3 dB down points. So I'll just move the marker here. So we'll say 13.6 hertz is the start. And then I'll move this over to the other side in the end. is 40.9 kilohertz. That's at the 3 dB down points. And what you see the top line there is just below full power here, right? We'll bring it to here and then you can see it's a 398.1 volts RMS right up here. So we get our calculator, that's squared. So we just go 398.1 divided by our load, which is eight equals Yes, 49.76 watts is what that made at that point. Again, I have this set up so it'll just go under its, you know, power before, you know, maximum power before it starts to distort. So let's check its 1 dB down point. So we'll go 1 dB down and check out its useful power here. So we'll say 19.6 hertz is the start. And 21.4 kilohertz is the end, and that's its 1 dB down point. So not bad for no feedback at all. I mean, that tells me this thing has got some pretty nice iron in it. All right, so they, uh, they chose a pretty nice audio transformer, and it's not even hooked up in ultralinear. So um, very, very nice. No feedback. So that is the response, 1 and 3 dB down. So what we're going to do now is set this thing up with feedback and try it again. So I'll click this on. So now it's in the minus 10 dB position. What I'll do is I have to readjust the amplitude here. So source and I'll go amplitude 4.3. Okay, put this back to frequency here again and we'll hit start. Here we go. This is what it does with minus 10 dB feedback. Get the marker out of the way. Okay, so let's check this 3 dB down point here. So 3 dB down will be roughly three boxes down. It's a little above the line, so we'll say right there. So with feedback, the top end is 75.7 kilohertz. I would say that's quite beyond our hearing range. So that's the 3 dB down point, and we'll go to the start. Right about there. So it starts at 12.7 hertz. Very, very nice. So let's go to its 1 dB down point. Let's see, we'll be nice to the amplifier. So the 1 dB down point is 16.36 
hertz. That's the start. And we'll go along here. And the stop would be 42 kilohertz, 42.2 .2 kilohertz. Very nice. So you can see the advantage of having the, uh, the feedback in. It really, really flattens the response and widens things up. So if we were to give this a little bit more feedback, it would make this even wider. Now the disadvantage to this is this has basically got 112 AX7 in the front end and that's it. The more feedback you add to the amplifier, the more drive the amplifier needs. So technically, the more feedback you give this with this phase inverter, the more depth the front end of this thing's going to be. You're going to need to really drive it. As you can see, I really needed to up the amplitude there just to, uh, to drive this thing up with the feedback on. Now again, feedback is personal preference. Uh, if you listen to an amplifier with no feedback, again, it'll make some, sometimes the uh, vocalists and things like that stand out and you'll click the feedback on and it seems to settle people back in the background again. Now that's because again, it's flattening out the frequency response. So it's making everything even. So basically it's pushing them back into the band so that they don't stand out anymore. So again, it's all personal preference. So all in all, I have to say this amplifier performs extremely well and it's, it's working nice. Like, I mean, it's, you know, the advantage of, of having, you know, very few tubes in the front end as well, right? You know, it's basically just, uh, you know, the 12AX7 in the input and then the output tubes right away. So not bad. So you can tell that they definitely did their research on this design. So uh, yeah, very impressed. Let's see how much total harmonic distortion this amplifier makes at 50 watts. So that's just a little bit under its maximum usable power before we can visually see any clipping. And in a moment, we'll also test it at about half power as well. So this is with no feedback. So the circuit's wide open and the test frequency is one kilohertz. Since there's no audio gain control on the amplifier, I'll have to plug the BNC into the front of the machine here. That way it's, you know, as I'm talking right now, it's not screaming away at 50 watts output. That's a little bit hard on my load as well. So here we go. So I'd say, point, it says 0.59 about, so say 0.59, 0.6% total harmonic distortion with no feedback at almost maximum power. That's doing pretty good. All right, so get rid of the source there. Now what we'll do is we'll test it with feedback. Feedback is on, go to source, change the amplitude, 0.3, go back. All right, so this is what it's going to do at about 50 watts again with the feedback. So here we go. 0 0.1, 0 0.19, so we'll say 0.2% total harmonic distortion with only 10, minus 10 dB of feedback. Not bad, not bad at all. Keep in mind that this is just about at full power. So next, what we're going to do is test this at half power. This is the amplifier's total harmonic distortion at 25 watts, or very close to. So here we go. This is no feedback in this position. Feedback is set to 0 dB. So I'd say about 0 0.42, 0 0.43. So let's try this with the feedback on. Need to adjust the source here. Okay, so this is with 10 dB and about 25 watts again. So 10 dB of feedback, here we go. So 0.23, not bad. Now you'll notice that it looks like it's moved up a little bit from its full power area. This is common with amplifiers. They move around a little bit within its you know, useful range. So if you recall at full power, I think we had 0.1 something. So let's try it again. So at full power with negative 10, let's go back to source. 
4.3. Yeah, so a little bit less distortion at full power. Interesting. But this is pretty common when you're working with amplifiers. You run across this kind of stuff all the time. It moves around throughout its throughout its range of power there. So let's try it at, say, 10 watts or something like that. Let's just uh, let's just turn it down right now. It's uh... okay. So right now we're at 2.8 watts and. Take a look. What does it make it? 2.8. Well, that's nice and low there. 0.08%. So if you have very efficient speakers, you have very low distortion. So I'll slowly turn this up. Again, this is in the 10 dB position. So it has 10 dB of feedback right now. Amplitude. I'll just turn this up to, we'll say, uh, try it at 10 watts. It's a nice usable level. So there's 10 watts of output right there. 0.15, 0.16, not too bad. Not too bad at all. Again, this is with feedback. So let's try this with no feedback. So I'll go to, uh, let's say 500 millivolts. We'll start out there. And I'll click the switch. So we're at 3.6 watts here. I'll just roll this up to 10 watts. 10.0 watts. Let's check it out. So that's with no feedback. So just about 0.3%. Not bad. 2.9. So all in all, for six EL34s in their configuration, it's doing very well. Again, impressed with the design. The next thing on the to-do list with this amplifier is to try to reduce the hum level present at the loudspeaker jack on the rear of this amplifier. As you can see on the oscilloscope, we have about 5.1 millivolts RMS of hum present there, and that's with no load attached across the speaker jacks. Basically the only thing attached to the speaker jacks is the oscilloscope. Now both of these amplifiers are going to be attached to some very large speakers and in a relatively quiet room that hum is going to be audible so we want to get it as low as possible. That's one of the reasons why I invented that Carlson Super Probe is to help me locate noises in chassis and it's great for audio work. It'll point out where all the noises are coming from in this chassis and it'll do it electrically so it doesn't have a microphone or anything in there. It's just a just a little piece of wire exposed on the end and it's going to listen around and you'll see that here in just a moment. This device here and all the plans and everything are available on Patreon so you can build one of these things if you'd like. There's printed circuit board plans and everything are there. This is just one of my inventions. I plan on sharing many more of my inventions on Patreon as well because hey that's what this is all about sharing knowledge right? So here we go. I'm gonna turn this thing on I'll grab the probe. I'm going to click it into the noise position here so it'll stay quiet here as I'm moving things around. So it's in the noise position right now, which is technically designed for RF work and for picking up noisy resistors and things like that, but we won't go into that right now. So what you see on the tip here is a completely isolated tip. You don't need to attach this into circuit. You just point it at things and it'll listen to them from a distance. For example, I'll move this away so the cord isn't touching the tubes because they are very hot. Let's point this at the diodes and see what the diodes have to say. So we can see that it's listening to the diodes here. So that's in the noise position right there. So we can follow noises around. We can also differentiate between 120 and 60 cycle hum. So if I go in here, you can hear 120 cycle hum. 60 cycle, 120. So it'll help you locate different types of hum. Now, the reason that there's 120 cycle hum in this chassis is because we have diodes and a full wave bridge, which is effectively putting all the bumps on the top of the line. So in a sense, we actually have a frequency doubler happening there. That's the reason that we have 120 cycle hum with full wave rectification. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna take the probe off that 
noise detection and we're going to search around the chassis for the noise. Now we're going to hear that as well with this. It'll be much more clear. You can actually you can hear audio in cables without even attaching this. You just point it at the audio cable and it'll listen into an audio cable. So we want to listen to where that 120 cycle noise is coming from because that's the noise present on the scope. It doesn't really seem to be all that much 60 cycle hum in there. So what I'll do is I'll point this at parts. You can really hear those diodes working. So the diodes are right here in the chassis. Now the blue lead runs from the diodes to this filter reactor over here and we'll see you can hear the filter reactor working. Now if we get close to the wire that runs into the filter reactor, that's running from the diodes, so th the most amount of noise is going to be where the, the actual lead-in wire is into the filter reactor, and that'll be here. As I move the probe around the filter reactor, you'll hear it gets quieter as I get to the output lead. See that? This is the lead that's coming out of the filter reactor. Well, from what we see on the schematic, we know that the filter capacitors are on the output side of the filter reactor. So these two large capacitors here are on this side of the reactor. So we can see that they're working as we get closer to the input side. Also, we can tell that that blue wire is running to the center first and the, wi the windings are running to the outer side here. So you'll see here, see it gets quieter. So we would know that that blue lead-in wire is going to the core side first and then the windings are working their way out to this outside here. So if we needed to trace a broken wire in a reactor, that would greatly help us out. So you can see here, we have 60 cycle hum, that's the main power transformer right there. Now if I move this around the chassis, I come to an extremely quiet spot right here. Now, you'll notice on the schematic, in the negative supply, they have a filter capacitor on the input of this choke here. And that's why this choke is dead silent. This choke is acting more as DC resistance in this circuit than it is as a reactor because they already have 47 microfarad before the lead-in wire on this choke. That's why it's sitting quiet. So you could almost replace that choke with a resistor and get away with it. In fact, I think you could. All right, so back to the searching here. So we know that we have a very noisy component here. So this is shielded. All right, so this is acting as core. You can hear, as a, you can hear me rubbing the the probe on here. Pretty much sounds like a record needle. So now, as I move over to this side here, I get to a quiet portion of the chassis. This is the first, or I should say, the phase inverter circuit here. It's pretty quiet here. As I get towards the power switch, Now keep in mind this is at half sensitivity here. I have to have this down because it's just gonna get so incredibly loud and it's so sensitive that I can point to things from such a, f a far distance here that it's gonna get you know, confused between the noise of the oscilloscope, the switch mode power supply and my lamps and everything else around here. So I have to have the gain set accordingly. So at any rate, we can see that this is a very quiet portion of the chassis, but as we get closer to the reactor again, on this side, So you can see that we have a, a quite a source of noise right here. Now this is probably one of the noisiest components in this entire chassis and it's bolted right in the center very close to the very first audio tube here or the input. So that's that 12AX7 phase inverter circuit. So we have an extremely noi noisy component right here. The input wire to this phase inverter circuit is right here to this first audio circuit right here. So that's where this shielded coax comes in, into this area here. Now we know that we have, you know, 60 cycles over here, right? This is the main power transformer. That's how noisy it is, okay? This is how noisy this is. So what does that tell us? 
this could be closer to the tubes than this thing. So what I'm going to do is just shut this thing off. I'll get rid of the super probe here. So what we can see is this thing is making a lot of noise, all right? So we know that the audio transformer, just from what we see in the chassis, the wires are coming out of the audio transformer like this. So on each side of this filter reactor here, which means the windings in the audio transformer are going this way. Now, which way are the windings going on our filter reactor? Well, they're going this way. So what's that going to do? Well, that's going to pose a coupling problem. Now, you'll notice that the windings on the audio output transformer are going the same way as the reactor here. So they're going like this. And you'll notice that the windings on this transformer are going like this. Now, that's the proper way to design things. That's the reason we don't see 60 cycle noise on the oscilloscope screen. All right. Again, winding this way, winding this way. That's the proper way of doing things. Unfortunately, the thing in this chassis that's making a lot of noise is this, and the windings are the same, in the same fashion as the audio transformer on the other side. So there's an extremely large chance that this is coupling through the chassis into that audio transformer and directly injecting this into the audio transformer or at least some of it. We also know that this extremely noisy component is only, I'll just get my pointer here because this thing is on. So the first audio stage or the phase inverter circuit here where the audio circuit, where the audio runs in, comes through this coax here and goes through this resistor right into the grid. Well, look at the distance. That's it. Between the, the 12AX7 and this filter reactor. There's almost no distance here. And we have wires protruding right up near this noise and everything. So this is telling me right now the noisiest component in the chassis, this thing, this thing is in the center of the chassis. The windings are in the same fashion as the audio transformer on the top and it's close to the 12 AX7. There are so many no-nos here it's not funny. Technically, this chassis should have been a little bit longer, and this should have been further away from the audio transformer than this thing, than the main power tranny. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to loosen this transformer off. I'm going to extend the leads on this transformer, and with a glove, I'm going to hold on to that transformer, and I'm going to move it around in the chassis, and we'll see what it does to this hum level here. And we'll see if we move this to a different portion of the chassis if this is the solution to lower that hum level. If it is, let's hear it very quickly and easily located the issue. I've now removed the screws from the filter reactor and I've also extended one of the wires because it was pretty short. So this way I can move this around the chassis and we can watch the result on the oscilloscope screen. Do not try this at home. That reactor has over 400 volts on it and I do have some gloves on here. Two gloves, be careful. Again, do not try this at home. If there's any leakage between the windings and the core, you can get an extremely deadly shock. So. I'll just lift this up here and move this. Look at that. From 5 millivolts RMS down to 1.3, 1.4. Now you can see when I rotate the transformer, now we're up to 2.3. Now we're down to 1.3 again. And as you can see, when I move this around the chassis, different areas, it's noisier. So now, I can feel this thing buzzing. This thing is buzzing really hard, vibrating in my hands here. So now what I would want to do is find a nice area in the chassis to mount this thing. So if I was to Bring it over to here. Look at that. This area right here. We're down to 680 microvolts, 640. You can just move this around very gently until you find the area that it's at the quietest. About right here. So 
I would be mounting this in this area over here. Look at that, 660 microvolts. That's gonna be inaudible in that speaker, completely inaudible. So basically, it's just component placement. So I put this back in its area here again. Look at that. So that filter reactor is going to have to be moved to another portion of the chassis here. And what I'll end up doing is moving a bunch of other components around and then mounting this thing most likely off the side with some standoffs or something like that. So I'll, again, I'll have to remove a bunch of these components, probably move them over to this side, and then the filter reactor will be this way in the chassis, because that seems to be the lowest noise. So what I'll do here is I'll reposition the camera and I'll get a closer view of the screen, and I'll just do that again without this in view, and you can see the result on the oscilloscope just a little bit better. Here's a better view of the scope screen. So the reactor is sitting back in its stock area again, and what I'm going to do is just lift it out of that area and bring it towards the rear of the chassis with my rubber glove on. Again, do not try this at home. There's high voltage present on this reactor. So here we go, I'll just lift it up. Now I'm just holding it in my hand here at the back of the chassis. Look at this, we're already down to 2.2 millivolts. So what I'm going to do is turn that 90 degrees now. So I'll just turn the reactor 90 degrees. That's just turning it 90 degrees. 1.5 millivolts we're down to already. So I'm going to move this to a quiet spot on the chassis. Here we go. Look at this, we're down into the microvolts already. So that would probably be the spot to mount it in right about there. A little bit of movement. So that's the area this reactor should have been mounted in, or with an elongated chassis in a different spot completely. So we can get the hum down to 640 microvolts RMS. With a speaker attached to that, that's going to be pretty quiet. Okay, so I'll just put this thing back in its stock area again here. Let's put that down here. Like so. Turn the scope off here. So I've got quite a bit of work ahead of me here. I have to do this, everything I've done to this, on the other amplifier as well. So I'll replace the filter capacitors and move the reactor around in that one. I'm going to have to move a whole bunch of components around to fit this thing in here properly because it's going to be kind of tight the way the tube sockets are in there and everything like that. So I have quite a bit of work ahead of me yet, but at any rate, there you have it. Thanks for stopping by the lab today. I hope you enjoyed this video involving these two large monoblock amplifiers. If you did enjoy the video, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be more videos coming like this in the very near future. We'll be taking a look at vacuum tube and solid state electronics alike. If you're interested in learning electronics in a different and very effective way, you might want to check out my ongoing electronics course on Patreon. I'll have the link just below this video in the description. So if you click on that link, it'll take you right there. If you do go there, check out the community section. There's many people sharing their projects there as well. So until next time, take care. Bye for now.